This recording is going to cover uh, parts of the axial skeleton. Um, remember the skeletal um, system or the skeleton is composed of, of the axial skeleton as well as the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton you see here in the left, which you see the blue, it's the skull, your ribs, your sternum, your vertebra, and some other structures that we're going to show you. And then we have the appendicular skeleton. We'll talk about that later. Okay. So, um, so the other things that, that I didn't mention before is that are part of the axial skeleton is the hyoid bone plus, and that's spelled wrong, is the auditory ossicles. So remember the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, which you find in the inner ear, those are also um, part of the axial skeleton. Now the skull is broken up into um, the cranium as well as the face. So the skull has 22 total bones. The cranium has eight bones and that's pretty much going to protect the brain. And it, it serves as an attachment point for the head and the neck muscles and also has cavities for say the, you know, the organ of cordi and the sensory receptors involved in equilibrium. The face has 14 bones, and that um, helps, again, perform that framework for your face. Uh, it's, again, it's got some special sense organs, cavities for them, like for taste and smell and for vision. Um, you'll have a lot of attachment for muscles in your teeth, obviously, um, um, so things like that for the face. Now, you'll notice that um, I have, in some of them you see one, some of you see two, well, some of these bones are paired. So, for example, in the cranium, you have a right and left parietal bone, but you only have one occipital bone. So, whenever you have two of a bone, you must indicate rights and lefts now. So, if I point to the right maxilla, you have to say right maxilla. You can't just say maxilla. If I point to the occipital bone, you just say occipital bone. If you say right or left, that's you're telling me that there's a right and left occipital bone when there isn't. So it's going to be important that you know these of which we have two or one of, and so you can make sure you know if it's going to be right or left. And you should know the numbers of these bones too. And the over here, the associated bones, you only have one hyoid bone, and we have a total of six auditory ossicles because you have three within the, um, the inner ear. Now, one of the things I uh, want to mention are sutures. Now, sutures are synarthrotic joints. They're fibrous joints. So synarthrotic joints do not move. And what connects these is very strong fibrous joints that pre prevents any type of movement. And you find the sutures in the skull. And I'm going to label these ones for you. So one of them that we have is the coronal suture. So think of it, it's like corona, it means crown. So here is the coronal suture. Here also is the coronal suture. So if you cut someone in that direction, you'd have a coronal section. The lambdoid also, I've seen it referred to as the lambdoidal suture. You find it back here. And so back, this is the back part. This is actually the occipital bone right here. I'm just going to put P and P. These are two parietal bones. This is the frontal bone, and there's parietal, parietal, and here is temporal, there is occipital. I won't go through the facial bones at all, but at least some of these so you have a frame of reference. So you've got the coronal suture, which kind of separates that frontal bone from the parietal bones. You have the lambdoid suture, lambdoidal suture, that separates the parietal from the occipital. We have what we call a squamous suture, and that you find that right here, right where the temporal bone is. So that's your squamous suture. And the last one we have is the sagittal suture. So if you did think of a sagittal section, so you cut along this way, this right here is your sagittal suture. So there's the sagittal suture there too. And I'm going to go to the blue over here, and here is your lambdoidal suture. So those are some sutures that you have to identify. Obviously, I can see some sutures here and here and here. We're not going to give them any names. 
um, you don't have to identify those. But these are four sutures that you must identify. Now, the sutures, some of these sutures, you didn't see them right away. When a baby is born, they have these soft spot, spots, they call fontanelles. And having these soft spots allowed that head to get through the birth canal. Um, and then after birth, some of the, these fontanelles will close. And the, the, the timing for different fontanelles are different from where they're going to close. And it's actually what they're going to become ossified. So they're going to be replaced by bone. Um, and then you'll have those sutures um, that connect the bones. Um, but you won't have to identify any of the fontanelles. I just want you aware of them. What you will have to do is identify all the cranial bones, all the facial bones, and you will have access to these pictures so you can see the colors, plus you'll have access to some labeled pictures of lab models of skulls. So I just want you to be aware of, you have to identify all the cranial bones, all the facial bones, and markings that you have, various markings that you have in your lab manual. So I'm not going through that because it'd be boring. So you can read them about it, and I'm just going to show you plenty of pictures that you'll be able to use for a reference. So here is a lateral view of the skull. Here's a straight-on front view of the skull. Here's where you take that cap right off, so you're looking down from superior view in. So um, you'll have pictures for this. And here's looking at from beneath, the inferior view of the skull. So review the pictures I give you, because you're going to get these same exact pictures. So you can use those. You also have to identify a number of different markings. Um, and so you have a table in your notes that goes over different markings, include sutures are considered markings. You have openings that refer to as like the foramen. So there are things for, um, things for um, like nerves to enter or exit in blood vessels. And so you have a list of different bone markings in your notes, you have to be able to identify them and you must be able to tell me the function or purpose of them. Unless you see a grayed area in your table, you won't have to do that. So you'll have to know those, so you'll have to review those. And you have a lot of pictures in your notebook that you can use to color and you can use the pictures I give, um, give to you. So you can do that on your own and then, but what I'm going to do is I want to go through some of the other things. So, so the skull kind of have to work on your own because you have a lot of um, things you can use for reference. Uh, but I may go through some of the other um, bones of the axial skeleton. So here's the hyoid bone right there. This is actually where you find it. It's actually the only bone that doesn't articulate with another bone. So it's not directly attached, so we, we have that hyoid bone um, to you know to help support the tongue. And I just want you aware of that if someone is found um, murdered or dead, they could tell if someone's been strangled because if someone's been strangled, that hyoid bone is often fractured. So if, some, if the hyoid bone is fractured, it's usually indicate they've been strangled. It's just a little tidbit of information. Now again, you have those auditory oscules. So here's the stapes, here's the um, incus, and there is the malleus. So remember you have each um, set of three in each of your inner ears. So they help to amplify the, the sound waves. And then we have our vertebra. So those vertebra protect that spinal cord. Now we do have some curvatures. If you're gonna see it here from the side view, is we have a cervical curve um, that doesn't develop until uh, the, ki the kid um, is able to lift their, their head up. Um, it helps to kind of shift that weight um, um, as a child learns to lift their heads. Um, we have a, um, this, so they call it a secondary compensation curve. Another secondary compensation curve is we have this lumbar curve right here, this little curve in our lumbar spine. Um, it helps to shift the weight over your legs. Um, the primary accommodation curves, we just, they don't happen later in life. You're born with those. So we have this thoracic curve that you see here. Um, and then we also have um, the sacral curve, which you see right here. 
Um, I just wanted to mention those to you. I'm not going to ask you any questions about the, cur the curves, but I'll ask you questions about the vertebra. So the cervical vertebra are found in the neck. A cervical means neck. You have seven total cervical vertebra. We've got 12 thoracic vertebra. And, remember, and lumbar, think, remember, lower back, we've got five of those. We have, um, in the sacrum, it's actually typically five vertebrae that have been fused together. Um, and then we have your tailbone, the co coccyx, usually referred to as the coccyx. That's usually four to five um, vertebrae that have been fused together. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the vertebra. So here we have the cervical vertebra. Well, the first two cervical vertebra have special names. You have to call them by their specific names and not just a cervical vertebra. So the first cervical vertebra is the atlas. And think of atlas, he, uh, from mythology, kind of supported the world on his shoulders. So the atlas is supporting your neck and it articulates with the occipital bone. So the these little these what you see right here, these art, articulate with the occipital condyles of the occipital bone in the skull. Um, your second cervical vertebra is the axis, and the axis has this structure here called the dens. These uh, C1 and C2 atlas and axis articulate with each other, and they do not have intervertebral discs be between them. Once you have an intervertebral disc between the vertebra, it starts to limit some of the movement. But here, these are an example of um, synovial joints or diarthrotic joints between the occipital bone and atlas and between the axis and atlas. Um, and so like the joint between C1 and your occipital bone, that permits you to flex and extend your neck, you like nod your head. Um, the joint between C1 and C2 is a rotational type of joint, so it allows you to look left and right. You're going to have a little bit more limited movement here, and this really doesn't show you, it's really poor, that doesn't show you the intervertebral disc, but we have intervertebral disc between the rest of these, and so you don't have quite as much movement because they're amphiarthrotic joints. But I want to show you kind of the, the vertebra kind of by themselves and kind of show you what to look for. So the atlas does not have a vertebral body. It has, or I should say, all of the cervical vertebra have transverse foramen. So you have to know transverse foramen. So you see these openings here. To me, and I mean, it's not just me. If you see transverse foramen, it's automatically, you know it's a cervical vertebra because none of the other ones have that. Um, the, uh, let's see, right here, that hole there, and right there, again, you see the transverse foramen. So the transverse foramen is actually where the vertebral arteries run. Um, you have uh, all vertebra are going to have this area right here called the vertebral foramen. So that's where the spinal cord runs is the vertebral foramen. So remember, foramen means opening. You can kind of see a little bit in here. Um, the Although I said the atlas doesn't have a body, but the rest of them do, and so you have vertebral body here, vertebral body here. Here's the vertebral body right there of the axis. Um, and that's where the vertebral bodies is like where you have in the case over here and here, where you have those intervertebral discs. The, the bodies will articulate with the next body, but you'll have an intervertebral disc in between them. Um, you have, you'll notice uh, with the... Um, Axis, the axis has this special um, process called the dens. So that dens articulates with the atlas. Okay, so um, it actually articulates right up here. Um, okay, dens I think refers to like a tooth-like process. Um, we have what we call transverse processes. So you see the transverse process here and here. On um, You got transverse process over here. They're on the sides. Um, you have uh, the transverse process you see on this side here and over here. 
typically the the transverse process are where you're going to have like the muscles that are attached on that coming in from the sides um you also have um what we refer to as uh, spinous processes so if you take your finger and you run it down someone's spine usually what you're feeling is the spinous process so you see spinous process not of the atlas and axis but you can see it real obvious here with the cervical one they tend to be bifid like this this one's not quite as because this is getting we're, we're getting ready to start the thoracic vertebra but these are bifid but you don't see um, with the atlas and axis um, you don't see real obvious um, spinous processes. Um, the uh, atlas is very ring-like and has no vertebral body, and, and it, it has a very classic look to it. The axis also because of the, the, ha the fact that it has the dens. Um, the thoracic vertebra, it actually I should say, some people say that the... Um, Cervical vertebra from the side, if you do the side view, they look like a fox. Uh, obviously like this one or this one, but not the first two from a side view. Um, the thoracic vertebra and the thoracic spine, you've got 12 of them. Now when you look at those, from the, you know, when you look at them, they say, some people say they resemble a giraffe. So you kind of just look at side to side. And you have to, with um, the thoracic vertebra, um, you, you still have to identify the vertebral body, which you see right here. You see the transverse process over here. Here is the spinous process. And then you have the opening for the vertebral foramen. Now the thoracic vertebra besides looking like a giraffe, the vertebral bodies are heart shaped. Um, and the spinous process projects downward. So actually this doesn't have it, but if I was doing the side, they kind of go like this. They project downward like that instead of going straight out like that. So they project downward. It's kind of hard to see very well because they're kind of like merging together. Um, so here, here's seeing a little bit better. So see how it projects downwards there? So, and then this tends to be heart-shaped, okay? Um, they do have some different facets for uh, articulation with ribs. But to me, the classic is look at it because of the looking like a giraffe and that spinous process projecting downwards, that it's a thoracic vertebra. Now the lumbar vertebra down here, you got five of them. Now they resemble a moose. So in these, gonna have very big vertebral bodies because they have to do a lot of weight bearing. So you have the bodies again here here is the spinous process, kind of that big nose right there. And then we have the transverse process, which is actually, you see it right there and right there um, is the transverse process. So here you're seeing side view there. Here's the body again. There's the body. There's the um, spinous process. And then the uh, transverse process is... Um, you see like here and right there you can see them there okay and then the last ones is the sacrum and the coccyx now they have a very classic look to them so the sacrum you're not going to get them separate it's all going to be these fused together so here's your sacrum it articulates with the fifth lumbar vertebra here it articulates with the coccyx here and later you're going to find out where the parts over here, what it articulates with. But so you've got the sacrum and you got your tailbone, which is the coccyx, and it's actually vertebra that have been fused together. Now, the last thing is the sternum and the ribs. The sternum is what you see here, and it's I have the different colored. The sternum has different regions. The top up here is the manubrium. It actually is going to articulate with your clavicle, which will is part of your appendicular skeleton. Also has articulation for your ribs too. The, here we've got the body, and down here we have the xyph we call the xiphoid process. Now here you see the sternum again, and up here you see here's the manubrium. The body is in the green, and the gold is the xiphoid process, okay? 
Now we have, you'll notice here, we've got the ribs associated. We have a total of 24 ribs, we call 12 pairs of ribs, and we have three types. The true ribs articulate with the sternum, and so they're one through seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, the false ribs are ribs eight through 12. Um, they will, um, they call them false because they don't directly um, connect through it. So here you see the costal cartilage there. See, they all have to come together like this. So they call them false ribs. And um, technically, the floating ribs are part of the false ribs um, because false ribs are ribs eight through 12 because they don't directly attach to that sternum. Um, the floating ribs are ribs 11 and 12, and you can see, like right here and right here, they don't articulate on the anterior por portion here, so you just see they kind of float. So these here be the true, these down here are the false ribs, and the last two of the last two pairs of the false ribs are called floating ribs. So that's going to be this um, last part of the recording. Um, we'll talk about, even though it's in your notes, we will talk about different types of joints. So, because um, like the, the joint between the first rib and the sternum, that's one of the joints that we'll have to know. and We'll talk about it at a later time. Um, that is a is an immovable joint, but the rest of the ribs, when they do the, the articulations is between the ribs and the sternum, they're actually synovial joints. Um, so they provide um, a little bit more movement. They call them gliding joints. So we'll talk about that at a later time.